Welcome to the Scrum.org Community Podcast, a podcast from the home of Scrum. In this podcast, we feature professional Scrum trainers and other Scrum practitioners sharing their stories and experiences to help learn from the experience of others. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hello and welcome to the Scrum.org Community Podcast. I'm your host, Dave West, CEO of Scrum.org, here in a rainy and wet Boston, Massachusetts. Today's podcast is focused on the journey um, of one of our professional Scrum trainers, our PSTs, uh, David Sabine, uh, and his journey to becoming a PST, but more importantly, his journey to Scrum and then the sort of evolution of that. Welcome to the podcast, David. Thanks uh, very much for having me, Dave. It's nice to see you. We haven't seen each other in a while in person, but uh, hopefully I'll be able to travel to Boston in the near future and see you again. No, I'm looking forward to that. It, it, it has been uh, three or, or so years. But uh, so I, I guess our listeners would like to know a little bit about you. First, uh, where, are you, where are you calling in from, David? London, Ontario. It's the other London. Uh, so it's in Canada, uh, about two hours away from Toronto. I've lived here with my family since... Uh, 2018, but I've moved around a lot. That's actually part of my my Scrum journey. I think we'll get into that over our conversation. But I've moved around a lot. Before living here, I was in Toronto for six and a half years. Uh, Toronto is Canada's sort of tech hub, one of the tech hubs. Before Toronto, I was out west in northern Alberta, and 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 I grew up in Saskatchewan in in the prairies. I've also lived in the United States, in, in which I, I, I've loved. Uh, I've, I was in Arizona for two and a half years and uh, Florida for some time. When I was a younger man, I worked on a, on a cruise ship from, the, 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 from Port Canaveral, Florida to the Bahamas. And uh, so I've, I've had a kind of a, a wonderful journey and now I'm in London, Ontario. Great. That sounds interesting. We'll have to lean into the, some of that. But obviously, listeners, uh, David is Canadian, so he's going to be super nice during this present during this conversation. So, uh, which is always good to know. <laughs> All right. Um, interesting fact. Come on. Have you got an interesting fact that uh, our listeners would like? Ooh. Um, yeah. Sure. I'm. I'm also a musician. I've been a musician most of my life. The largest audience I ever performed for was 26,000 people. I wasn't wow. alone. It wasn't a solo performance. I was with a large band. Um, but that's been pretty wonderful. Uh, and, and I think having been a musician that has lent to, uh, let's say, a greater understanding of incremental improvement, yeah. um, which also ties back to the work we do as scrum trainers. So yeah, interesting fact. I was uh, I, I performed for the Queen uh, two times while she was uh, traveling through Canada. There that's, you go. that's interesting. I've never performed for the Queen. God rest her soul. Uh, but uh, but um, that's uh, that is super interesting. Wow, I didn't know that. It is though the amount of trainers um, that are also musicians. I think there's. You know, there's elements of discipline, there's elements of performance, there's elements of incremental improvement, there's elements of you know, sort of uh, working with others. There's all those things that I think come true when, when, when you're as a musician practicing, practicing our craft. All right. So, you but know, on that point, I would be also interested to know of all the musicians that have become professional scrum trainers and, and are associated with scrum.org and that, that you talk with frequently, I would be interested to know how many of them are also self-taught programmers. Um, that's certainly true of myself. I don't know if that's been a pattern you've observed. Not really. I, I actually don't know. That's very interesting. I, I definitely see a correlation between, between people that have got that sort of desire to look at complex problems to break it down to control you know that sort of software engineering kind of gene or that engineering gene and and then the music music part you know the i think there's a very interesting correlation i don't know how much self-taught versus um professionally taught i know that our cto uh is self-taught software engineer and actually 
that the reason why he got into software engineering was because he was touring the country in a band, mm -hmm. uh, a heavy metal thrash band, which, uh, yes, you, you do not want to listen to. But the, um, the, uh, the you're very good for scaring, scaring your animals. But uh, it's, uh, yeah, so uh, that, so the, that, that does support your hypothesis. All right, let's, mm -hmm. let's, let's get into Scrum, because that's what our listeners are here for. Yeah. You, know, um, you know, what did you, wh when did you discover Scrum? Where were you when you discovered Scrum? Tell me a little bit about your Scrum journey. Trademark Dave West, by the way, Scrum Journey. Scrum um, Journey, yes. 2007, um, that's when I learned of Scrum. And I think that my path to, or, like, to that point is interesting and important. Um, early 90s, I joined, uh, like I enrolled in university. I finished high school, so I, joined, I, I enrolled in university in 1993 to study music actually, and to become a music teacher. I thought maybe being a band director in my future would be my path. But 1993, I also got an internet connection and um, right click view source changed my life. I don't know if you remember, you know, the early yeah. web browsers. Yep. And I, I, I saw HTML and I thought, well, wouldn't, you know, that's really interesting. Um, some of my assignments throughout university, I decided to do as web pages instead of uh, keynote presentations. Um, and I then within a couple of years realized I could do that and make money at it. I could make websites for small businesses around my, my local, uh, like I was growing up in Southern Saskatchewan. And um, so I became a freelancer. So by the late 90s, early 2000s, I was freelancing. I had written some software that I was selling online. Um, people my age that are listening might remember websites like Hot Scripts. Uh, I, I, there were a number of others, but this is before the age of GitHub. You know, if you wanted to find software, you were looking for freeware or shareware. And um, I hit a wall in about 2005 and six when I, I, I didn't, I, I couldn't scale my software. I didn't know how to make big software. I, I was making small database applications and websites for small businesses. So I decided I needed to expand my horizons a bit. And remember by, the, by this time I was self-taught. Um, I had finished my university degrees uh, in music uh, but I, the way I say it is that my, my computer always paid my bills and music has always warmed my heart. So here I am in 2006 and I've hit a wall. I don't know how to scale. I don't know how to make bigger software with others, you know, to collaborate with other people. So I joined a college. I got a job in an IT department at a college and I thought, well, certainly they know how to make big software, you know, they're an enterprise. And what I witnessed, of course, was all of the dysfunction of the enterprise and realized that uh, they, they don't have a clue how, how software is made. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they've managed to cobble together the necessary systems, uh, mostly through purchase, you know, a student information system, a library information system, finance administration systems, HR, these kinds of things. The CTO that I worked for at the time had the foresight to contact a scrum trainer and fly them from Toronto to Northern Alberta, where, we, where, I, where the college was. And so it was in 2007 that I took a two-day scrum training class, and that's how I was introduced to it. And what did you think? when you first met, because you didn't come from a sort of more traditional waterfall PMI sort of background. You were just sort of developing projects, seat of the pants, you know, working through it, you know, maybe having a bit of a bullet list of a plan, et cetera. But so you, so you were then presented with this thing called Scrum. What did you think? I thought that makes great sense. Like, why doesn't <laughs> everyone do this? Like, really, I, I, I really thought, that that would be a perfectly sensible way to operate in, in, a, in an 
environment like the college. Uh, I also thought, gosh, every musician should learn this too, because you know one of the things musicians struggle with is, let's say, the business side of things or how to coordinate and organize. Um, <laughs> so that's what I thought immediately. I, I just thought this is common sense. Let's do this. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I recently, well, actually a couple of years ago, introduced Scrum to a veterinarian hospital, and they obviously didn't come from any of the sort of history. And they, and the uh, the the COO stroke chief vet or whatever said to me, she goes, "Well, how else? This is just so straightforward. How else would you work?" And and obviously, so they went from chaos to this way. And I a very similar, yeah. You know, wow, we could use this everywhere. And suddenly there was a million backlogs everywhere. And they were like, well, maybe you don't need quite as many. But uh, it was uh, it was a very interesting moment. All right, so you discovered Scrum. You were infected with the Scrum bug, and said what well, makes total sense. What happened next, David? Two two things happened that I think are interesting. One is that we. We returned to our regular office the next day. And I remember we had a meeting in a, there was a sort of open space where we would gather. Um, and in that meeting, uh, the CTO of course was there and he asked us to reflect on this scrum training experience that we had just had. And um, I remember I put my hand up and said, hey, you know, I think we should try this. and. If no one else wants to, I, I'll happily volunteer to be the Scrum Master. So that proposal sort of went around the room and everyone thought about it and, and there was nods and people were agreeing, you know, visually and, until, I, I don't remember who called it out, but um, the decision was made. Yeah, let's try this. Now, we had two distinct sort of operations one was our help desk and the other was systems administration and, yeah. and development stuff. So the help desk, they weren't entirely on board at first, but the others, including myself, we were, we were a scrum team as of that moment. And I was the scrum master. The second thing that happened was um, I got really annoyed actually, because the CTO took to heart, you know, there's this, part of the scrum guide, the end note, where um, the authors remind us that scrum is immutable. And although implementing parts of scrum is possible, the, remote, the results may not be scrum. Uh, the CTO took that to mean appropriately uh, that if the way we work resembles what's described in, in the scrum guide, then we can call it scrum, but if the way we work is likely to not resemble it uh, perfectly, then let's call it something else. So the CTO, he used, he wrote on the whiteboard scrum with a K. So <laughs> yes, because, because the college where we worked was called Keanu College with a K. And so he said, let's like, we're going to have to adapt this to our environment in, in Keanu College. Uh, so Scrum in Keanu will be S-K-R-U-M. And I was annoyed by that at first uh, because I, I really wanted to give it a go. And uh, his doing that seemed to give everyone permission to break all the rules. And and not, to not, not do Scrum. Really. To not, yes. not really try it, you know. When it's hard, stop doing it, you know. Yeah, yeah. In hindsight, I think there was some wisdom to, to, to that um, because the college environment, let's say, even though he was CTO and had positional authority, the work we were doing and the way we were positioned in the, in the college, we weren't able to create the kind of disruption that uh, Scrum would require or cause in that, in that setting. So to fit into the financial governance and some of the, you know, long-term planning. And uh, so we were then, uh, so let's just say my experience in my journey, I then experienced what is, I think, a very common situation for people that are trying to use Scrum. And that is that they find themselves in a large environment that is not conducive to, uh, to Scrum. 
and then compromise comes and some of those compromises may be necessary but many might not be the choices are always hard all right so you've you you you're still working on that college what happens next david what happens next is i um so i was in the it department at the time and all of a sudden this wonderful opportunity happened where um a member of the music faculty at that college left. Um, she, she resigned her position and uh, moved across the country. And there was this opening in the faculty of performing arts, which as you recall it, from my story, uh, I had- yep. That's earned, your vocation. That's what you wanted to be, right? Yeah. And so I had always wanted to find a way to blend my musical passion with uh, software development and, and IT or, or technology. And here was this opportunity to join the music faculty. Um, and so I applied and, um, and I won the position. You know, I had a master's degree in music and lots of experience with technology. And they wanted to create an audio recording uh, program within their performing arts department. Yep. So it seemed like a match made in heaven, and it was fantastic. I, so that happened um, in 2008. So from that point forward, I started to employ, let's call them agile practices, in my curriculum development and in my classroom. Um, so I was looking at, you know, practices like Crystal and Scrum. Uh, there was a, a a practice called Open Agile at the time, which was sort of a framework similar to, yeah, yeah. and it, it was like a scaling idea. Um, and I was very interested in how that could help me to organize my curriculum and my classrooms. That culminated in uh, 2011 and 12, when two things happened. One was I was invited to speak at a TEDx conference given the work I was doing in the classroom to combine agile practices with some gamification techniques with, you know, modern curriculum design. And, and so that led to a TEDx talk. And uh, in the same month that I was invited to speak at TEDx, I was also terminated. Because, <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, gosh, because um, you have to, so let's remember, I'm in Northern Alberta at the time. Yeah. And what is the economy of Northern Alberta? Oil, right? Yes. So I'm at a college with a thriving or a, a, a liberal arts, performing arts department trying to thrive in this environment. And uh, in 2011, following, of course, the 2008 financial crisis, mm -hmm. in 2010 and 11, they could just no longer accommodate the budget for this performing arts program. So the entire performing arts program at the college was 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 cut, and uh, so my position stopped. Uh, it was it was so bizarre because um, I thought there, there was just so many wonderful things happening, and that the program was on the precipice of of something really great, uh, but it ended. So you took these skills and obviously to your to your next gig so what happened next this is super interesting so i had to think carefully about and by that time by the way i was um i had just gotten married oh. and uh my wife and i talked very carefully about what our you know what should be our next pursuit um and i was disappointed to realize that my particular skills had very limited appeal in Northern Alberta. Um, even let's say, like I could fall back on technology, maybe look for uh, employment in uh, IT departments, but all the IT departments that are operating the businesses of Northern Alberta, they're not located there. Yeah. You know, um, Exxon doesn't have, which is Syncrude, in Canada, they don't have their IT group there, they have it somewhere else. So anyway, I was thinking carefully about how, where my skills are valuable. And it became obvious that my skills are valuable where there's a tech, you know, a thriving tech hub. 
And uh, in Canada, that limited my options to Vancouver, Montreal, Toronto, perhaps. Uh, and so I, I started to look around in Toronto and connected with a really fascinating company called My Planet Digital. They are now rebranded. They're, they're now called Orium uh, Incorporated. But they were doing some fascinating work um, building web apps, uh, which is something I had always been comfortable with. And uh, they were building apps for some pretty interesting companies. Their, their clientele was starting to include you know, let's say Fortune 500 uh, enterprises, uh, enterprises with $100 million of market cap or more. And um, I joined my planet in 2012 as a product owner for a team called the Strategy and Support Group. So there was an interesting turn that happened there in 2012. I landed, I would say, from my you know, previous uh, crisis, I, I landed in a great uh, in a great opportunity and carried on practicing scrum mm -hmm. I, I i assume actually yes yeah. so so my planet um and I, I i should give credit to the directors and and jason who 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 founded the company with a few of his uh, close friends they created an environment that was thriving um you can you can imagine um a company of, uh, well, when I joined, I think we were 32 people. It grew to its maximum at about 140. Uh, but these were, this was a company of teams. Um, and each team had a portfolio of enterprise clients for which they were producing products, uh, applications, mobile apps or web apps or other sort of middleware or you know, various other things. And each team was give, given significant autonomy. So a lot of my uh, experience as a scrum trainer, you know, that I bring to the classroom, really, I, 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 I bring a lot of that memory to, to my classes where I can talk about contracts that are uh, where scope isn't fixed, where instead we would write our our definitions of done into the contract, which was a, pro a, a quality promise. You know, no matter what we build for you, because our product backlog is going to be very flexible, we will test every feature in these ways and ensure it's this you know this level of performance and this level of quality and so forth. So agile contracting, um, working in small cross-functional teams with uh, the whole array of skills necessary for product development. So we, in our teams, we would have uh, you know, marketing experts, design expertise, coding expertise, the, the, you know, the whole gamut from sales sometimes, uh, contracting, support, uh, everything necessary to build and bring products to market. That, that that is unusual and yeah. definitely a leading edge. We obviously all aspire to that. It's often a lot harder to break that industrial mindset and and really build those cross functional teams. I know we're we're coming to the end of our time together, so I, I do want to get to one very important question. Why did you want to become a PST, David? Because. Uh... As you know from my story, I, I've always felt it very important to be teaching. Uh, you know, I wanted to be a music teacher, for example. And um, then I did become an instructor at a college. So curriculum design, instruction, uh, adult education has always been one of the paths, you know, that I've followed, let's say. And becoming a professional scrum trainer, I think was a great way for me to mix that passion with my interest in scrum and the experience that I had earned and I could share that experience with others. Um, so there, you know, in a nutshell, I think is the reason I wanted to be a PSD. Also that, that the professional scrum trainers uh, are fascinating. You know, this is a great group of people, very intelligent, very interesting, lots of incredible experience and to be, I guess recognized in, you know, by others in that community as a fellow expert uh, was quite an honor, and uh, it, I still feel that honor, uh, even though I've been a professional scrum trainer now for five years. You know, it's still an honor to be part of this group. 
Well, it's great to have you part of this group. And I certainly learned a lot more about your journey today, um, which is fantastic and really quite unique. It is interesting what you said about the community and how varied and how, uh, you know, smart, intelligent, whatever, that those experiences bring come together. Your experience is, is very unique and it puts you in a, a really in, a interesting position when when working with clients and when teaching this consistent, scalable curriculum that we have. So thank you for being part of this community, David, and thank you for sharing your journey with, with, with our audience. Um, well, thank so, you, Dave. Uh, speaking of clients, I have uh, a, a wonderful client now that I'm leaving you to go talk with them. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you. And uh, thank you for our listeners. That was David Sabine uh, talking to us about his journey to become a professional Scrum trainer here on the Scrum.org community podcast. I'm your host, Dave West, and I can't wait to, to talk to you again on another podcast. Bye, everybody.